Colossians 3, 5 to 11. So what's it all about? It's all about killing yourself. It's all about sexual immorality. It's all about sociopathic tendencies. And it's all about uh, Jesus. I, uh, as is my want, I put the passage into a Wordle and uh, I just, just copied it and pasted it in. And as you know, this little program thing runs a job, little job of JavaScript, and it ends up putting largest on the page or in the pattern in the design the, the thing that's most emphasised in terms of the repetition of the words. And uh, it was really interesting this time. Because look what it came up with. There's this whole jumble of stuff. Bad stuff. But look at the recurring theme that comes out of that. Yourself. And that word self is translating the Greek word sarx, which is all to do with your sinful human nature. Our sinful human nature. So it's all this stuff that goes on, but it comes back to your sinful human nature. And that's what this passage is about dealing with today. Does that make sense? Does that help? You can find that sometimes, don't you? You read a passage of scripture and it's all, it's all well topped up. It's all uh, lots of stuff in it. And that can really help, can it? What's it all about? It's about our sinful self and how we then go about dealing with that. So the passage is all about all sorts of bad things that comes generally under the heading of yourself. And yourself, self in the Bible is shorthand for the sinful, selfish human nature we were born with, but we will be born into glory without. So we've got it now. We were born with it here, but when we're born, as it were, into glory, it will be dealt with then. It belongs to the old order. It belongs to the old age. It belongs to the world that is passing away and we shall be redeemed of it in heaven's rest. I say we're born again into glory without it because that's when it's finally going to be killed off. It has been completely killed off since the day we were born again, since the day we decisively turned from sin to trust Christ and he gave us life. But the ghost of that old nature keeps on coming back, as it were, to haunt your psychological house and to seek to tempt you to go back where you and I no longer belong. Its power is gone. But it still exerts a pull until that day. We need to be very careful about how we understand quite what Paul is and isn't saying here because most of the treatments of these verses that we are looking at they are, um, well, they divorce the text and all this stuff about dealing with sin. They divorce it from the context of Colossians 3, certainly in context of Colossians 2. And what they tend to do is they say, well, there are these things and they're wrong and you must stop doing them. And as we all know, that works really well. Right? Because it's almost the case, isn't it? The more you try, the harder it gets. To do it like that, and Paul has been spending some time in Colossians, Taylor 2 and beginning of 3, showing that that is not how we as Christians deal with sin. So we need to be very careful to set this in context and maintain Paul's intentions, because otherwise, if we take that out of its context and deal with it in the way that I was just suggesting, then actually what we're doing is not promoting what Paul is teaching, we're actually promoting what the heretics were teaching at Colossae. Say law, rules, regulations, ritual, do it like this. Human effort. Paul is saying, the way to deal with these things is to set your mind on the things of God, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. As we saw last time, it's to do with what you look at, and it's to do with what you look for. That's how to deal with it. So, what's going on here? But Paul is saying, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. He is calling for earthly nature to be addressed and dealt with. But spot that therefore. And I was asked the question, what's it there for? It's there to say, because of these things I've just been saying to you, 
He was able to put to death the earthly nature. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your, set your mind there, set your view there. Look at that. And then verse 2, aspire to things above. Not to earthly things. Because you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The key to dealing with the, these things of the flesh, these things of the lower human nature, these things of this world, is cultivating that life which is hidden in Christ in God. And from that you will derive the strength and the power and the faith and the flow of the Spirit into your, into your heart and life. It comes when we're justified by grace through faith alone. It comes each day as we trust in the flesh. It comes as we put the Gospel into effect again. Not as we resurrect the law and try harder. But as we feed our life this section of Paul's letter to the Colossians is turning now from dealing with the heresy to dealing with the person you're going to be based on, on the truth that you're getting back to. You stop dealing with the heretics and their error and so on. This is now about yourself and the person you're going to become on the basis of the truth. And they have been helped at all by the heresy, but they have been put right about the actual truth. And Paul has now turned to dealing with who you're going to grow into, consistent with the truth that's been re-established in your life. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You've died, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What's going on? We're going on to therefore put to death. Because of this, this is how set about putting to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And this is really important. See, heresy never comes along hot from the hands of hell, purporting to make you into a worse person. It always comes along saying this will make you superior. Or this will make you better. Doesn't it? Heresy comes along to say this will make you a better person or a superior person. Sign up to this religion, ritual, religion, or rule, believe this teaching, and in one way or another, it will make you either a better or a superior man or woman. And Paul has been showing these Colossians that it might at first look like that. But the things they're suggesting are in fact of no actual value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul's words not right. No value. And we make our rules, and we make our, we set up our shibboleths, you know. Oh, I shall, I've been scarred, you know, uh, by the, the first men's, uh, boys' Bible class I went into after I was converted. Not as badly as the guys that were there, because I fought back. But every week, the text was read, and a small, tiny portion was taken of a very small book and taken ages over, and therefore, boys, we can see that we should not go to films, we should not go to dances, we should not go to the cinema, we should not. Rules that were meant to keep you clean, that were meant to keep you pure, and didn't work. Some guys who were in that class, who'd grown up in that environment, in, in Christian homes like that, disastrously difficult. That's not biblical, it's not right. And Paul is telling us in Colossians. These things are of no value in restraining sensual indulgence. But what is? Is cultivating your hidden life in Christ with God by grace through faith alone. It doesn't make you a better man. It doesn't make you a better woman to sign up to the ritual rules and religion approach. And that's Paul's whole point here in Colossians 3. He's been showing these Colossians it might look wise, but that it doesn't help at all. And as we've seen in previous weeks, it is getting your mind on the things, the hidden things, where the Christian's hidden life is lodged, on the basis of what Christ has done, what's happened in your life to do with Him. Looking at that and looking forward to those things, looking for those things. That's what reforms and reshapes your mind and your self-consciousness as a citizen of the heaven you're headed to. And that's what redevelops your heart and your mind as a child of God. So there's the inner urban wasteland in need of development. Your psychology and mind, your psyche and mind. And here's how it gets redeveloped. By cultivating the life we have in God. If, on the basis of grace and faith, you set your mind on a new world coming. And if, on the basis of grace and faith, you set on your mind on a new world coming, not the old world dying, and getting ready to be sent completely up in smoke, that world we don't set our minds on, 
you'll not just think you'll act as a citizen of heaven if that's the way you're leading your inner life. And that's what Paul's trying to show them here. That's the crucial context. His correction of their thinking about how to get holy. And it's against that that you need to read every word of Colossians 3, 5 to 11. Because here's, here's where he starts listening out those things. And the natural human reaction, because we're all Pharisees and legalists at heart, is to go to these things and say, I've got to stand on that, I've got to stand on that, I've got to stand on that. And actually, we feed the life in Christ. And then we start with it. There are three lists of five things in this passage. So I thought I'd dig the table, because some like pictures. It's a shame Mike couldn't make it. Because I know he loves these. He loves pictures and dark tables and diagrams, right? It sort of takes the words out of it, doesn't it? The first list of five things here that we're looking at today is, is all this stuff to do with what Paul calls your members, your limbs, your physical attributes. So the first list in three, five, three, chapter, chapter 3, verse 5, five things that are to do with what we do with our physical bodies. And then you've got chapter 3, verse 8. These, these things we do with our psychology, our social interaction, our mouths in particular. And then in chapter 3 verse 12, which we're not going to get to, five things that come out of feeding your inner life. And building a relationship with God and living in His grace because of what Jesus has done. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. And these clash with the other two groups. Now these groups are things that the Jews used to blame the pagans for a lot. The pagans are scandalous! Look at this! And they do this as well! But there was no talk of this. And this is new in the Gospel. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Nothing like a quick table with some colours on it, is there? So, what's going on here? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, and there's this list. Paul is not turning away from grace and faith-based sanctification to telling these Christians they've now got to work it out by ritual rules and religion, in short, by works. To preach this text as if he denies this gospel, mauls this text, okay? Two particular areas of earthbound life Paul is going to single out that need to be addressed. Things that relate to your earthly nature. Things you do with your members, things you do in your social interactions, particularly with your mouth. First of all, Paul is going to tell us how we are to relate to this earthly nature we've died to. How do we relate to the world around us? How do we relate to our earthly nature? How do we relate to the old man? We put it to death. It's as if he pointed to it, to our old nature, and he said, not fetch, but kill. Now that's what we're going to survive. Because the way a lot of things happen in a lot of churches with a lot of youth works and stuff like that is that you're, you're, you know, the natural world around you, the fallen world around you, is something you'll fetch, not something you'll kill. We're here to kill it. And for all we talk about nurturing our inner life and our walk with God and our justification by grace through faith and all the rest of it, it's based on dependence and turning away from the world as it's currently constituted, our flesh as it currently works, and turning to the grace of God and the gospel. It's not go fetch, it's go kill. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. But do it like this. And he does it, um, it's very emphatic. That word for make dead comes up first in the sentence. Bop. <laughs> it's a bit of a shock. Do you see what I mean? Necrosite. Necrosite, who tamele to epitis case. Your members that are upon the earth, like your limbs, your physical attributes, and whatever. All to do with this world. All to do with this. Uh, put to death. Chapter 3, verses 5 to 11. Then put on. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Then be subject. Chapter 3, verse 18 to 4, 1. And then finally watch and pray. Chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Four distinctive catchwords of early Christian practical theology. Put to death is the first one we're looking at now. Put on, chapter 3, 12 to 17. Be subject, chapter 3, 18 to 4, 1. And then watch and pray, chapter 4, 2 to 6. Catchwords of Christian discipleship in the New Testament. 
This particular section has been described as the negative one out of the lot, because it contains these injunctions to kill off and to put off the old sinful nature that we rejected in repentance and faith and baptism, along with these two catalogues of vices that we've listed out. And that putting to death relates to the two groups of issues Paul cares to mention to them, as the product of false faith and the product of false practice. He mentions them here, the products of that. Sexual immorality comes from that, and these sociopathic tendencies, as it were, the antisocial behaviour comes from there. Now, he's not going to go out and issue an ASBO, okay? but he is going to say, go oh, build your life in Jesus. And then we'll see the difference in your church and the way things happen there. Then we'll see a difference in your church meetings. Then we'll see a difference in your church politics. Go oh, build your life in Christ. It all rests, this putting to death, it rests on that feeding and nurturing the life of God. Putting to death the negative old life, it's a pretty positive thing to do, because it comes about through um, <coughs> the life in Jesus. What belongs to the earthly nature? Those two groups of five things. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is like idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. He used to walk in these ways, in the life he once lived. See that? Paul is stressing, there's this old way, and there's this new way. He's stressing that you were like this. <coughs> you were like this, you Colossians. How encouraging is that to have a church that was given over to all those things, but now they've got a different way of life. They've got a different attitude, they've got a different outlook. Two lists of things on the screen there appeal to your five senses, don't they? Those two on the left. They appeal to the senses that we've got. They, they, are, they appeal to the way that all our sensory and, and mental input comes into us from the visible old world, the old world that's passing away. Now look at something else he's been saying. Set your mind on the things above. And now we're ready to dive into the actual slaying thing. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Necro means to kill in the sense to make dead. And Paul is using that as a metaphor to speak about dealing decisively with the old nature that belonged to the old us before we made new in Christ. It's a decisive thing. To take something and put it to death is a decisive thing. There's no turning back. That's done, isn't it? Finish. That's what he's talking about. He uses that a lot, doesn't he, Paul? He uses that in Romans 6, do you remember? Dealing decisively with the old nature that belonged to the old us before we were made new in Christ. Romans 6, 11, he speaks of the Christian's best course being to count yourselves dead to sin. He's using the aorist here to, to point to a decisive initial act, produces a, a subsequent subtle attitude as a decisive act, and then it leaves you with a subtle attitude following on. What he put to death? Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Well, that's a bit of a, an explanation rather than a translation in the NIV. It says, the body parts that are upon earth. You haven't got this word members. You don't say that anymore. Your members are sort of people who belong to a club, yeah? Um, but members is, you know, your body parts. Well, that's, that's fair enough. Your body parts upon the earth. These are the things that belong to your body parts upon the earth. What, what they give rise to is that five things in the table on the last slide. We know what characterizes those body parts upon earth if they are killed off, but what's Paul getting at with this phrase? Well, in the New Testament, the word is used of literal arms, legs, stuff, hands, feet that make up a body. And in Romans 6, 13 and 19, for example, the Apostle points out that the reader's body parts can be offered on the one hand to sin as instruments of wickedness and impurity, or on the other hand, to God as instruments of righteousness and holiness. F.F. Bruce says the word members comes to include the various kinds of sin which were committed by their means and in which the flesh, the old nature, expressed itself actively. So, just be aware again that in this context, because of what we've said, Paul cannot be primarily describing sort of arm wrestling with particular deeds of naughtiness. 
Now they're going to be talking about supreme efforts to beat down particular besetting sins. He's saying, put to death, therefore, by this means, feeding your life with God, living by grace through faith alone, by that means, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. These, these acts of your members. It's got to do with the transformation of the will, it's got to do with a new attitude of mind, as C.D.G. Moore put it a long time ago. It's a radical shift at the very centre of the personality, from self, by which he means the sinful self, to Christ. Shifting the very centre of the personality, from self to Christ. So death to selfishness is by no means too strong a description. Paul's not turning away from grace and faith-based sanctification. He's saying it doesn't work by works. It actually works by grace through faith alone. So put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. And the life you once lived. Three things he's got to say. Kill yourself. Now that's not kill yourself, that's kill yourself. Right? Secondly, do it because the wrath of God is coming. Thirdly, do it because that's your old life which you put to death, be consistent. So he's saying, deal decisively with your sinful self. You've seen how to knock it on the head. Do it because the wrath of God is coming, and Christians actually, we should all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we should all pass, you know, our deeds will be tested with fire, right? That which is gold and silver will remain, and that which is straw, hay and stubble will be burned up and consumed with God. The only sense with gold and silver and we need to straw again, because straw is quite valuable these days. But uh, build those solid things. And do this because that is your old life that has passed away. And in consistency with that, you put it to death. Some reason. Okay. Now here's how you will notice the old nature going. It'll be part of your life that's hidden with Christ and God, but it'll put an end to these things here. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. When you hear again on Facebook, Google Plus or Twitter, that another big church leader, often a big transatlantic church leader, so it appears, perhaps that's because they're much more into social media than us, has again blotted his copybook. What has happened? He said that, oh dear, he's gone and got caught out in a particular act of the Far more serious and far more fundamental than that has been what happened a long way down the road, which nobody noticed because it was part of the hidden way. Because at that point, somewhere back down there, he stopped feeding the life that's hidden in Christ with God. And that's where he started losing the strength and the power and the orientation of his life on Christ and on the kingdom that's coming, not on the one that's burning up and passing away. See the point? There's an old uh, saying, they tell me, in uh, security circles, national security circles. First of all, you become a mental defector. And on your way down the road, you become a defector. So a spy becomes a defector a long time before he defects. Because mentally, he's become a defector way back somewhere. And that's true for every single one of us. It's true of every single one of us when we cease be feeling the life of God within us. Cease to be feeling the grace of God and the gospel within us. Start to lose the joy of sins forgiven. Start to minimize the reality of our own sinful human nature. And therefore start our appreciation of grace starts to be coming. Does that make sense? And it's at that point that we become vulnerable. And it's that point that we, we begin to fade. 
And it's only way down the road that you end up in a situation where your earthly nature is taken over again, and secular morality and purity lust, evil desires and greed, which is like our truth right now. The really worrying thing is how much of those things we see. Not so much because of those things, and aren't they shocking? Because of the death of the soul, the way back somewhere that it points to, while people have continued as if nothing had changed. Does that make sense? Yes, I have lost my place in my notes. Okay, well, there are all those things that we could be shocked by, and there are all those things that we could have uh, thrown our toys out of the pram about in church life. There are things that belong to the Colossians' pagan past, things, as we've said, that the Jews especially reproach the pagans for. Most of the time, in my experience, when you're having to deal with these things, I've just been asked to do another student house party show again. Uh, we'll see. These things come up, and, and the discussion centers around what each of those words actually means. I haven't done that today, you noticed. It centers around what those words actually mean, because people are actually asking the question, how much can we get away with? The answer, of course, is you can go just as far as you like. But if you're actually living a Christian life, you won't be going anywhere with any of this because you'll be looking for and looking at something completely different. And that's where we've all failed. We're looking at and looking for something completely different. See, there's this, this ridiculous tendency to see, well, that person or that person or that person, they failed in this, that, 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 and that. No, we've all failed because we've all managed to get our eyes off what will keep us from the obvious failure in this list. And we've all failed. And we're all standing in the grace of God. For the record, sexual immorality is pornea. It means sex happening outside the world where the Bible says it should. That's a pretty big category. Is it not? You want to know where sex ought to happen? You go back to Genesis chapter 2 and it tells you a man leaves his father and his mother, is joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Did you see Doctor Who last night? Yeah. Is, it, is anybody... Still waiting to see it, or can I talk about it? I'm waiting to see it. I'm not talking about it. You got that illustration? Gone. <laughs> Take off that. Um, oh, right, well, it's for two, not one or three. It's for committed relationships of the sort described in Scripture. And it's for two different people as well, by the way. Not for two the same. Ever in Scripture. Outside of these bands, that's what Paul is. Impurity, a catharsia, it means literally impurity. Physical or moral uncleanness or impurity. You know you sink when you go to it after that, piled all the stuff in, and it's all grimy at the bottom. I'm not giving away too many secrets here. We all sink like this. Um, yeah, all that stuff, that's, that's a catharsia, that's unclean. Lost is pathos, a strong emotion, passion. Use biblically to describe a passion for that which is not where you're going. Not your future. Not what you just look at or look for. Evil desires is epithumian cacking. Pretty literal translation. Evil wanting. Why is greed in this list? Have you wondered why greed is in this list? <laughs> Unusual. Play anexia, that's what it means. It means the greedy desire to have more, avarice or covetousness. Wanting what you shouldn't have, not because it's wrong in itself, but wanting what you shouldn't have because it's over and above what is sufficient for you. And it's idolatry. And the word is literally the word for, you know, dancing around bushes and trees and stuff and making craft works, <laughs> you know? It's that word. Greed is idolatry. Again, it's that lack of control of what you're going to do with your physical members because you've set your heart on the wrong things and because you've been looking at the wrong things. And what sort of world do we live in in regard to that? 
thing that ties all these together is the inability to say no to oneself when one should. Either because the thing desired or indulged is wrong in itself, or because having that much of it is just wrong in itself. Crosses God's boundaries to indulge the sinful flesh because it's not looking at or for the things that a Christian does. It's all about the indulgence of the sinful human nature in, con in connection with unrestrained physicality and the desire for more of it. But the next list, it's all about antisocial tendencies. The indulgence of the sinful human nature in connection with unrestrained sinful psychology. You must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Not lying to one another. Because you've taken off your old self with its practice. It's done. So it's still gospel finished stuff. And I've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. I haven't got time for that today. Fancy a conclusion? Yes, they said. It's five past twelve and you've been losing your place in the notes and it's getting boring. Okay then. See, there's a temptation to see things happening in the church's life, even in our own lives, in the lives of people we know, perhaps even are close to, to see things happening there and to be shocked and disgusted and go straight back to being the old Pharisee we were before we were converted. Living on a rules based religion, ritual, and whatever practice, and not dealing with ongoing sin in believers in the way that God has designed that we should. And that's kind of serious. Because you get got no defences if you're in that situation. The temptation to get back into ritual rules and religion was to give you a bit of an edge, supposedly making you a better or a superior person. And we either sense the need to be a better person myself, or we, we, we feel a bit superior to them and want to. Because we want to be special. Why do people want to be special? This is a red herring, really. Why do people want to be special? Why do Christians want to be special and stand out from the crowd and be acknowledged and esteemed. We do that when we have not sufficiently understood that our significance lies in the love of God for me at the cross of Christ. That is sufficient for me. He is my all-sufficient Saviour. It is enough for me to be loved by God in this way. I am a significant, now listen, just you get this, I am a significant person, okay? Not because of anything I've said and done, but because, or because of the accolades I receive from the evangelical community. I can see this clearly because I don't get it. But because of the blood that was shed on the cross, because of the love of God for me. I don't need to feel superior by keeping a set of rules and regulations or to be better than them because they've been caught out. I don't need that, because I've got a Jesus, and he loves me like that. The temptation to get back into ritual rules and religion is there you know, making you a better or superior person, or to think that you are. But all those human advantages that the people at Colossi were looking at, or for, they're blotted out by universal human sin and sinfulness. And the ground stands level at the foot of the cross. Look at verse 11. There is, here there is, no Gentile or Jew. Stop vying with one another on the basis of your ethnic heritage. There is no circumcised or uncircumcised. Stop vying with one another on the rituals that you have or have not undertaken. Barbarians, what the Gentiles call the Jews, amongst others. Scythians, slave or free, these are distinctions made by men and of no importance. Touchstones and shibboleths the ancient world would cling to, so folks could assert their own superiority over others. But Paul is showing it is actually only the unmerited favour of Jesus that is going to make humanity any little scrap better or more worth looking at. At all. Regardless of heritage, race, or culture, Christ is all and is in all. And if he is all and is in all for you, then these other things become irrelevant. And by the way, you become the better person that your ritual rules and religion could never make you. Does that make sense?